and welcome to another episode of Radio Hermetica. Tonight's show, I'm talking again with my good friend Richard Ward about an author that we both have read and have found absolutely fascinating. He's become very influential in the world of the occult, although he passed away a few years ago. He was the, the founder of the Typhonian Order, which is a very important esoteric organization, and he's the author of a number of books, both fact and fictional. I'm talking about the writer and author Kenneth Grant. And tonight, Rich and I will be discussing Kenneth's work. I think our first question is, who exactly was Kenneth Grant? Well, Kenneth Grant was an occultist, for want of a better word, uh, a practical occultist. Um, and although um, he was heavily influenced by Alistair Crowley, it'd be wrong to call Grant a thelemite, um, because although he met um, Crowley in 1944 and stayed with him, uh, in, or in regular contact with him uh, in Crowley's final years and did learn a lot about Western magic from uh, the Great Beast. Um, Grant was not a Thelemite and uh, found uh, a lot of um, his learning came from other people, um, some that he was introduced to uh, by Grant himself. For instance, uh, um, he was introduced to the koala schools of Hindu uh, tantric mysticism by David Kerwin, who he met through uh, Crowley in 1946. And uh, Grant started uh, really writing in earnest, um, particularly with reference to the Tantric tradition in the 1950s in a series of articles that came out in some various publications. Um, he was also a poet um, and uh, expressed his uh, magical uh, ethos uh, through poetry. And um, this was also augmented by his wife, Steffi Grant, who uh, still survives him. Uh, Grant was born in 1924, by the way, and uh, passed away in, 19, uh, in 2011. Uh, but his wife, Steffi, his, long, his lifelong magical partner, still survives him, and uh, her paintings uh, served as a, a visual representation of much of which uh, Grant um, uh, wrote about magically. Um, and uh, Grant was also um, a comparative mythologist in the same sort of manner as a lot of the great 19th century mythologists such as Gerald Massey who was one uh, in particular that Grant looked to um, because uh, Grant's big thing really was defining what he uh, saw as the Typhonian tradition which is um, uh, a tradition of magic which uh, went back um, through ancient Egypt and also had its roots in uh, ancient Mesopotamia as well and this is where uh, Grant saw uh, the roots of uh, not only his own magic but the roots of, uh, of that which Crowley taught and uh, a number of others. Wow, <laughs> so he very busy early on in his life and there's a later on as well. But, uh, um, so tell me more about this whole Typhonian tradition. Um, as I say, the Typhonian tradition is something which Grant uh, sought to define in that um, set Typhon as a deity in uh, ancient Egypt, and as uh, most uh, occultists uh, and learned uh, listeners out there will already know, that uh, set as a deity was not always considered bad. He was uh, demonised uh, under the Hyksos uh, dynasty in ancient Egypt, and uh, this was basically his fall from grace. Before that, he was, you know, sort of a, a well-liked creator god, more, you know, sort of along the lines of uh, sort of Azaris and a lot of the other, sort of Armen and a lot of the other main, you know, sort of Egyptian gods. But the story of the battle between... Um Set. Yes, there's so. obviously the very famous uh, battle between uh, Set and uh, Horus, which again is, is a later uh, uh, rendering and uh, one that uh, is quite interesting because uh, a lot of Grant's um, uh, magical lore, say when he looked at people like uh, Gerald Massey, the, you know, another great mythologist, they looked at uh, astronomy and astrology um, and looked at a lot of these stories as astronomical allegories. And certainly if you look in um, certain of the uh, Egyptian zodiacs uh, that, are, that are left, um, uh, it does seem that the contest between Set and Horus does, is very probably an, an astronomical allegory. Here's a little slide question for you. I often discuss topic that's never really been resolved. What do you think Set is? in terms of the animal shape, because it's very unusual, isn't it? A long kind of snout with pointy... It is. I mean, several people have tried to sort of pin it down, some of, you know, and, and set has, has got various sort of totemic animals associated uh, with the deity, uh, which Grant uh, records in his books. Um, among these are the pig. Um, also, then we have... Some people have said that it looks, uh, set looks like an anteater. 
oh, yeah. um, which uh, you know, he's, uh, and that there are there are various other you know sort of uh, hypotheses to which sort of uh, you know animal you know sort of set is, and uh, there's also uh, quite good grounds for suggesting that he may also have links with sort of um, the jackal and other you know sort of. Um, uh, Underworld uh, deities uh, such as what were out in Anubis. I think it's fair um, to say that most Egyptian gods, you can recognise the animal that they represent, obviously it's the head and the body is still human, but that one is the perennial mystery, isn't it? Exactly what Seti is supposed to be. It is, yes, yes. I, I'd probably have to defer to, uh, you know, sort of. Uh, other scholars, I mean, uh, cer certainly um, if people wish to look deeper into uh, the set animal, um, probably uh, um, T. Veld's book, um, Set God of Confusion, which mm. I think has now been reprinted or at least once, um, is, is probably uh, the, the place to look. He goes quite in depth into, you know, sort of the origins of set and the animals and that sort of thing. But as I say, Grant looks at it more in terms that a lot of these animals associated with Set were different totemic animals, which uh, represented different parts of the uh, of the god's uh, psyche. That kind of brings us on to a bit we'll talk about later on, of course, that the, the publishers of a lot of grants or republishing a lot of grant material is Starfire. Well, I think they're the ones who are producing the Set book, if I remember right, or planning to. That, that, may, that may be, although uh, unfortunately, due to the fact that uh, uh, Starfire, you know, very sadly has recently suffered a, uh, a catastrophic mm. uh, warehouse. Uh, um, uh, fire, which destroyed a lot of uh, the stock of the uh, the trilogies, which is the the main books that Grant is uh, known for. He wrote uh, nine sort of main magical books, shall we say, which uh, are each, each is a trilogy of books. There's three trilogies, starting uh, in 1972, I think it was, with uh, the Magical Revival, and then ending with uh, the Ninth Arch, which I think was published, but I'd have to check this, around about 2011. Um, get into little detail about this book a bit later on, because I think it's something that is definitely needs to be covered more, in more detail, because they are uh, uh, fascinating and baffling in many respects, uh, um, Grant's books. But you know, just going back to the Taphonius of itself, is he the originator of the whole notion of the... Of the he certainly the coined the, tie, the, 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 the term, the, uh, the Typhonian tradition, um, and although a lot of people, you know, have looked back and you, you can see the origins of this. I mean, if you, if you do look, for example, at the work of Gerald Massey, um, you can see a lot of uh, uh, stuff written, particularly with an astronomical and astrological bent, which relates to Sept Typhon and uh, the gods, you know, sort of original place in the pantheon, if you like. Um, so, as I say, it was really from people like that that uh, Grant got the idea of a, uh, a Typhonian tradition as much as uh, from Crowley who you know did uh, you know sort of uh, Crowley obviously had his own you know sort of uh, ideas and his own you know sort of guides for want of a better a word that came through to various of his uh, you know sort of um, seers uh, that, uh, that channeled uh, certain writings um, and um, uh, Crowley obviously uh, linked his this uh, Personage Iwas, which um, most of, well, obviously all Thelemites out there will be familiar with, and most other people as well, I should think, these days. Um, um, and uh, Cro Crowley basically called uh, Iwas Set Iwas, and Grant followed on uh, to this as well, and saw, you know, a connection between uh, Iwas and this whole current that uh, Crowley himself, uh, you know, channeled, which, uh, you know, sort of most uh, famously was put down in uh, the Book of the Law in, 1904, uh, in, in 1904. Let's just briefly um, tell us a bit more about Iwas, because some of our own... Well, I'll say, I, I, Iwas was a personage which appeared to Crowley and also channelled through, uh, as I say, various uh, seers, usually Crowley's, uh, you know, sort of wives or scarlet women um, that were around him at the time. And uh, this, uh, you know, sort of personage certainly seems to have been connected with uh, Set and also Crowley connected it with ancient, you know, sort of um, uh, Mesopotamia as well, which uh, certainly has, you know, led to, uh, of coloured, should I say, Grant's uh, uh, sort of uh, standpoint on the matter. Okay. So what other influences would you say there was on Grant himself as was? There are, there are several. I mean... Um, so if we go through the main ones, we've already mentioned uh, Alistair Crowley um, and uh, the Hindu, you know, sort of tantric tradition, particularly the, the Koala schools of uh, southern India, um, uh, because uh, Grant was very, very interested in uh, the writings of Advaita, the, uh, oh, yes. the school of uh, Indian mysticism, of the, the oneness of all things. Mm -hmm. 
um, because Grant saw everything as interconnected and uh, he saw other influences particularly pertinent through art and uh, fiction as well. I mean, uh, he was very, very good friends with the artist uh, Austin Osmond Spare, who again was uh, somebody who knew of Crowley's work and I do believe was briefly, either was briefly within Crowley's Argentum Astrum or certainly uh, sort of received some teachings uh, to do with it. I'd, ha I'd have to check that further, that further into that. That was a magical order, wasn't it? It was, yes, that's right. Yes, yeah, I mean, uh, beyond obviously uh, um, the OTO, which is... Uh, which we'll get onto those uh, moment, we'll, we'll, a bit of a story. We'll get onto later. Yes, of course there is. <laughs> yeah, so, so you've got the whole uh, Indian mysticism through, you know, sort of Tantra and Advaita. Then you've got um, the sort of... Uh, the stellar mythology, as I'll call it, from people like Gerald Massey and various other writers from the 19th century. And then also you have things present in fiction because uh, Grant was very, very interested in what he saw as magical truths uh, contained in fiction. Mm -hmm. um, he looked to a number of writers in this regard, um, including Dion Fortune, Arthur Macken, and in particular, uh, Howard Phillips Lovecraft, mm -hmm. the American uh, horror fantasy writer, who basically, uh, you know, I mean, it would take a, you know, <laughs> a, a whole interview on its own, yes. I think, to go through uh, <laughs> Lovecraft uh, work. in detail. Um, but he, he certainly saw within uh, the, these fictions um, ways of describing um, not just magical rites, but... Uh, the way he he describes certain entities and the worlds which in and the dimensions which which with within which they lived, um, which appealed to Grant, and that he could see these as resonating with certain aspects in his own working occult tradition. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's one of the kind of the legends and stories about Lovecraft, isn't it? That maybe it wasn't just fiction after all; he was channeling something. Although I think he himself denied that. So it was just fiction yes, he did. Up. Yeah, a lot of people have said with regard to Lovecraft that he was a prophet that channeled unseen forces, mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, whether that was true or not, so all, we, all that can be said is that Lovecraft himself was a, a complete rationalist. Mm -hmm. um, he did not really have any time for what he considered, you know, sort of magic and the occult, even though he did possess one or two books uh, in his own library. Um, for instance, Waite's Black, uh, Book of Black Magic and of Pacts, and also um, his chief influence in his fiction was... Um, Lewis Spencer's Encyclopedia of Occultism, mm, which sure. uh, he, uh, you know, was published in 1920, and uh, Lovecraft got a lot of, uh, you know, ideas from that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Grant also, of course, it must be remembered, wrote his own fiction as well, yes. so, some of it very much within what I would call a Lovecraftian mm. sort of mould, and... Uh, the reason being that Grant felt that fiction was the only way that he could actually put into words some flavour of the magical rituals that he actually enacted because it was something that was very, very difficult to actually explain in normal written terms. And uh, as I say, also uh, his wife, Steffi, you know, sort of... Um, uh, illustrated a lot of these things as well. If you look in within the pages of the Typhonian trilogies and other books on uh, Kenneth, that Kenneth Grant has produced, um, it will be full of artwork from both uh, his wife Steffi and various other people that have also tried to express, uh, you know, the Typhonian tradition uh, uh, through art. Before we really get on to the the main core material that he's best known for, the the, the three books of three the trilogies, can you tell us a bit more about the fiction actually? Because that's quite fascinating. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, Grant looked at the Western era esoteric tradition and uh, saw it, that it stemmed from three uh, distinct sources, which were Egyptian, Hebraic and Chimeric, which is basically um, the tradition relating to set typhon from ancient Egypt. Um, and then obviously uh, he saw a lot in, you know, sort of ancient Hebrew writings and Chimeric really is a, uh, a, a word meaning Celtic, um, in which he saw a lot of uh, sort of... Uh, sources in sort of Welsh and Manx and things things like this which uh, formed a core part of the heritage of the uh, the Typhonian current itself and um, he actually looked looked at fiction and saw that these three currents were mainly represented by certain authors that uh, he saw particularly Arthur Macken, um, Blackwood and uh, J. Brodie Innes uh, who combined um, 
elemental, atavistic, and the magical in uh, in their works in a way which uh, no other you know sort of authors managed to do. And then when he came across Lovecraft, he saw that actually all three of these things Lovecraft managed to put together in his uh, in in his fiction. And uh, that's why I think that uh, Lovecraft in particular, I think, is probably the, the, the chief fictional. Uh, um, uh, influence on on Grant's yeah. work um, because of this, and uh, Lovecraft also was very um, interesting in inventing sort of uh, parts of uh, you know sort of occult history. He invented his own grimoire called the Necronomicon, which Grant uh, you know sort of um, delved into, and also looked a lot at uh, parallels between things like. Um, Lovecraft's Necronomicon and Alice, Alistair Crowley's Book of the Law mm-hmm. um, and I think it's in The Magical Revival, the first uh, of the, uh, the the trilogies that uh, Grant actually gives a table of correspondences between the work of Lovecraft, Crowley and uh, you know sort of all, all of the uh, the ways they kind of tie together and although some scholars have looked at this and said you know, I'll, you know it's, it's on a little bit of dodgy ground some of this to be perfectly honest but Certainly, when when you when you view it in terms of the current as a whole, you know, they are very interesting. These parallels, you know, there's there's no doubt that Lovecraft certainly um, was onto something, which um, in a way which few other writers were. And something else that um, really fascinates me about Grant is uh, the the fact that he also looked at cutting edge as it was then particularly uh, you know so, uh, as it wasn't really uh, mainstream he looked at quantum mechanics and quantum physics mm-hmm. and this was another area which again even though it was even more in its infancy in Lovecraft's time Lovecraft was something was very interesting in this mm-hmm. as well and how that science would actually validate certain you know sort of uh, esoteric ideas which uh, you know Grant has written about extensively yeah, as we're seeing more and more in modern times that increasingly appears to be the case certainly is there any particular title you've recommended the fiction to someone to f- first get into uh, for Grant's fiction mm. um, probably from my own point of view um, against the light right. I think yeah. because it's a book written which um, details in fictional form uh, the rituals of the New Isis Lodge, which was Grant's own, uh, you know, magical working uh, lodge within the Typhonian tradition, which started in the early 1950s and was uh, headed up by himself and his wife. And there were another of, number of other people uh, which uh, participated in the rituals here. Um, but that book, uh, perhaps more than any other for me personally, gives a real flavour of the sort of the, the otherworldliness that uh, Grant experienced, the the experience that he had of, you know, other dimensional beings and entities and the strangest of the rituals, you know, that happened. I think really, although they're mentioned uh, to some degree within the trilogies, particularly within some of the uh, the later books, within Hecate's Fountain, for example, um, but I think Against the Light really is the one which, if you want something to literally sit there read and read it at face value and take it and think okay i know this is fiction but this is actually describing magical rituals that actually took place i think that will give you a better flavor of grant's uh, you know sort of uh, magical ethos than any of the other works mm. so that's against the light worth checking out um so let's get into the real core series time yeah shall we do time then we what's the light the light i'm going to see if i can't say it's for three minutes Yes, so let's get into the real core material, the, 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 tr- the three trilogies of yes. Grant's writing, perhaps his best known and certainly most interesting material. What can you, how did they come about? What was the idea, do you think? Well, originally Grant actually approached uh, his, pub- uh, his publisher Muller and was going to really write a book on um, occultism which heavily featured Alistair Crowley. Um, but then at the request of the publisher, uh, the book was too long and Grant actually split the first book into two. So the, f- the first uh, two books in the trilogy, shall we now say, um, The Magical Revival was, was the one that started off and kind of introduced the, uh, the Typhonian current and the sort of the ethos behind it and the kind of the people behind it. And then the second book, which was concentrated more on Alistair Crowley and on his, particularly on his uh, system of sexual magic, uh, which uh, Grant was very, very uh, interested in and forms a core part of the Typhonian current, um, that came out, I think, in the following year, uh, 
1973, uh, Alistair Crowley and the Hidden God. And then the third um, uh, one in the first trilogy was Cults of the Shadow, which came out, I think, in... But I may, I may get these dates wrong, Andy. I'll have to say some doing these from memory. I think it came out in 1975 or around, around then. Um, and Cults of the Shadow really looked at people which reflected the current that he'd already talked about in the first two books. So it, it went in people like uh, Michael Bertio, who's... Um, uh, most famous for his uh, voodoo Gnostic system in America, which is like a, a hybrid of uh, sort of Haitian voodoo, Freemasonry, Japanese Kamai spirits, and various other bits and pieces. Well, um, the ideas, and uh, it is, yes. And, and then he, he looked at various other people like Fratarakad, Charles Stansfield Jones, who was uh, Crowley's, uh, you know, sort of adopted magical son, Austin Spare, and, and various other people that actually um, sort of perpetuated, shall we say, you know, the, the Typhonian tradition as Grant saw it. And the second of the trilogies begins with um, Nightside of Eden, which is uh, an exploration of the night side, as uh, Grant saw it, of the Tree of Life, or the mm. Tree of Death, as some people have uh, talked about it in, uh, term, in uh, Kabbalistic terms, um, which is exploring the clipothic entities which are associated with each of the dark sapphira on, mm. the, uh, on the Tree of Life. Some that I've been obviously, as you know, researching yes. recently, and finding some really interesting lack of evidence for some of these things, which is quite fascinating, but not saying I'll talk about this time, but maybe I'll get into another No, cer certainly, obviously, Grant's influences on the Clipothic uh, stuff mainly stem from Crowley's Lieber 231 I mm. think it is mm. um, which uh, and certainly you know Crowley was obviously influenced in that regard by the Golden Dawn and influenced it by the the book that Mathers did, which uh, yes, yes. I know you've looked into on, on uh, clipothic stuff. Which is there, um, when things go a bit awry, as I'm discovering my own research at the moment, because there's nothing be before that. It's, it's, these terms and names seem to have appeared out of the blue, and it's um, a fascinating thing. I mean, one of the things that got me interested in the first place, well, I did read The Knights of the Reading, I've not read all of Grant's books, but that's one I have read in some detail, and that question came up, the, what is the origin of these names? But it's still a fascinating work, the, the tunnels are set as a big feature in that, again, which is the path of the the clip offers as the opposites of the parts of the Kabbalah, which is all fascinating stuff, and uh, definitely has a it's a working magic system, no doubt about it. But it is for me one of the, my favourite of his books. Is definitely that one for different reasons, but certainly that's my favourite. Yeah, and then uh, they followed that up with um, Outside the Circles of Time in 1980, which um, is probably for for many many years and probably still is Grant's most misunderstood book. Mm. Well, this um, is hard work. I have uh, a lot of people that read it really can't get their head around it because it's m it's heavily devoted to um, shall we say the Lovecraftian mm. you know tradition the you know what Lovecraft wrote about in his books and uh, how that fits in with um, Grant's own you know sort of views of the Tyrhonian tradition and how it works to do with you know certain other dimensions and you know extraterrestrial beings and things like this. Um, and uh, one thing that Grant used a lot, and that I know he's been, you know, sort of pulled up a bit, you know, sort of by various mm. occult scholars, in that uh, um, using this comparative, you know, sort of system of study uh, to sort of back it up, he's used a lot of Hebrew gematria, which is uh, yes. the, you know, sort of um, where certain words have the same numerical value when spelt in the Hebrew alphabet. Um, but uh, the problem with gematria is that. Um, some it depends on how you spell the words because yes. of course Hebrew does not contain any vowels, yes, yes. and then it's, uh, it's it's whether you actually you know sort of some some schools say you know oh you should take out the first of the vowels and use the second or whatever and there's there's various schools of thought with you know sort of but you can obviously change the grammatical value of of a word you know sort of quite easily and quite you know convincingly I mean obviously you know sort of examples of this can be seen you know sort of within uh, Crowley's writing who sort of obviously influenced Grant in, in this regard because Crowley was big into his gematria as well and you know sort of saw a lot of importance in you know the uh, the Hebrew value of words but then you know for example he changed obviously the word Babylon and he changed the Y Crowley and put the A in to make it Babylon because mm -hmm. uh, 156 as that uh, then equates to in Hebrew gematria was a a groovier number Absolutely. than what it was with a Y. So it's... Of course, it's Caronzon. Of course, yes. Yes, exactly. Which is no H in any version of these writings or publications ever. 
Yeah. This is it. So, so as I say, it, it, it's certainly not an exact science. Mm. Um, and then uh, the second trilogy uh, sort of um, completed with um, Hikati's Fountain, which is the book I just mentioned, which is, for me, one of the most fascinating of Grant's books in that it does give some kind of flavour of the um, the rituals of the new, the new Isis Lodge. And uh, certainly that, although I advise that anybody that, you know, wants to try and tackle Grant, the best way to do it is to actually start at the beginning of the Titanium yes, yes. trilogies and read through. But uh, having mentioned Against the Light, I think really sort of Against the Light needs to be read in tandem mm -hmm. with yeah. Hikati's Fountain because they cover a lot of the same ground. But within... Uh, against the light, Grant was able to obviously give his pen a bit more free flow uh, in terms of being descriptive, uh, which he couldn't really perhaps get away with in, in writing, you know, a factual, you know, for want of a better, you know, sort of term, book. Uh, um, of the last three, I think there's an area that we need to tackle, it's, it's been mentioned briefly, of course, the Typhonian Order, as it is now called, used to be called something slightly different. It did, it uh, used to be called the Typhonian OTO, yes. Um, but, uh, Unfortunately, this stemmed from a letter of succession which was supposedly granted to Grant to establish his own English Ordo Templi Orientis to, to give it its uh, you know full title, which was the you know the order handed down via Theodore Roos mm -hmm. uh, through Crowley and various other people. I often thought um, that Crowley founded the OTO, which of course he didn't. No, he didn't. No, obviously it was a German you know sort of a, a cult order um, you know as I say uh, uh, before Crowley came along, but some, something which was probably. Crowley's biggest influence, even over the Hermetic Order of the Golden Door, which, yeah. although he was a member of for a while, basically, you know, saw them as a, a bunch of armchair magicians <laughs> that he hadn't really got a lot of time for, which, you know... It's funny, he's very much, Mrs Crowley, very much saw Mathers as a kind of a hero, one that to begin with, and then very much turned against him. Oh, he did, obviously, and this is particularly, uh, uh, you know, evident in the, the fact that Crowley published Mathers' translation of the Goetia in 1904, um, but because of the antagonism between the two men at the time, um, he merely uh, said that it was translated by dead hand yes, and uh, because Mathers was dead to him yes, and, you know, uh, as far as he was concerned at that time. So Crowley has taken um, over the OTO and then there's a succession on after Crowley's gone and that's what we got. Yes, and then, as I say, there was a letter supposedly granting... Uh, um, uh, Grant, you know, the headship of, you know, an English uh, OTO, but unfortunately this was... Uh, later revealed to be a forgery mm. and um, now the uh, the Ordo Templi Orientis in America which you know sort of is very kind of hot on you know sort of uh, not so much you know sort of owning you know well almost owning a copyright of anything which is to do with you know sort of Crowley in the OTO and uh, there was a, a you know a court case unfortunately which uh, the, uh, the Typhonian Order, as it's now known, uh, lost, and uh, that's why they had to change the name to the Typhonian Order from the Typhonian OTO, because obviously if, um, if you look at uh, early um, uh, publications of um, Starfire Journal, which is the, uh, the Order's, uh, you know, sort of mouthpiece, if you, if you like, that various members and non-members have put, you know, sort of grant-related pieces and, you know, sort of things like that, and essays, including myself. Um, that uh, the the original ones say this is you know the uh, the, the, the official or the official mouthpiece of the Typhonian OTO, but then as I say, that had to be later changed to the Typhonian Order, mm -hmm. uh, which it now is. And uh, to be honest, personally, I don't see that as a bad thing because um, it, for me, Grant was never a you know. I'd never categorised Grant as a Thelemite, although he was influenced by Crowley. So were a lot of other people, as we've already talked about, you know, uh, Crowley was only one influence on Grant, albeit a major one, but certainly he did not, uh, you know, just set out to, you know, follow the riches of Alistair Crowley. Grant, you know, set out to literally expand that into, you know, and just saw what Crowley did as part of the, the Typhonia tradition and sought to, you know, kind of extend that and to restate what the Typhonian tradition actually should be going back to ancient Egypt in the pre-Hyksos days when you know mm -hmm. before Set was uh, you know made a demon for want of a better word. Absolutely. So that's we've covered the, the first two of the trilogies and um, perhaps you can just speak about the third I think again I've, I've had a, I've got one of the books from this third trilogy and I've read bits of the Martin I read all of them they're hard work aren't they they're a little strange in some places 
yeah, the final trilogy in the three starts with uh, Outer Gateways and really sets things up uh, because the, fi the final trilogy really is devoted more than any other to Grant's findings and the the channeled writings that were actually received from the otherworldly entities that uh, the um, the lodge uh, themselves worked with, and this is kind of set up in uh, um, uh, outer gateways, and then uh, you go on to um, beyond the Mo Zone, which talks about I should just say perhaps what the Mo Zone actually is. Yes. But, um, the Mo Zone is an area that Grant saw almost as like a hinterland between worlds that uh, is like a a limbo would probably be the wrong way to say it but it's 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 like a an area that can be accessed astrally which is between the dimension in which we dwell and the dimension in which perhaps otherworldly entities dwell and when I talk about otherworldly entities I'm not necessarily talking here about sort of people from you know sort of other galaxies and stars although Grant did see you know sort of a lot of these entities as being you know extraterrestrial as in you know stellar you know sort of based. Um, it's interesting I think he's one of the few that had a strong connection between the so-called ET extraterrestrials and the occult. You don't tend to get many other writers who draw those parallels or bring those sort of things together. No this is true although Grant was of the opinion that, uh, and rightly in my view as well, that when nuclear testing started within the 1940s, that somehow this kind of ripped some kind of hole in the space-time continuum and sort of allowed these entities to come in from the world that they were, you know, sort of in, into our own. And uh, it's quite interesting that, you know, beyond, you know, if you want to look at Crowley and, you know, Iowaz and, you know, sort of other entities that Crowley, you know, sort of uh, encountered in terms of, you know, extraterrestrial, but a number of other Thelemites, you know, you've got people like um, John Whiteside Parsons, who was a Thelemite who followed uh, Crowley in America. He had a UFO uh, or an extraterrestrial encounter in, in, in the desert with something that he called a Venusian. And uh, mm -hmm. there are various other people, you know, that, that kind of did the same, which are around the occult, you know, sort of. And to me, this is just merely a an updated cultural conditioning in the fact that yes. uh, they are seeing these things in terms of extraterrestrial because that was the big thing at the time yes, following absolutely. the big U first big absolutely. UFO flap in 1947 I think it was and then you have you know sort of Roswell and all the rest of it and uh, the same things I think you know I've been visiting us for years and years and years but you know they would have been viewed as fairies or goblins yes, or something else uh, in, in the past. Just but, a little uh, sideline, I think um, one of your listeners might recognise the description there of entities from other realities coming into our reality during uh, nuclear testing, because that theme turned up in a TV show on during the summer that we both watched, we've got Twin Peaks. So oh yes, of course, yeah, 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 actually, yeah, I mean, when, when I watched uh, Twin, the new series of Twin Peaks, I thought, has this, you know, has David Lynch been, you know, reading any Kenneth Grant? Because well, I can right. see so many parallels, you know, apologies for those out there who don't know anything about uh, Twin Peaks. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, to, 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 to me, the, the Crimson Room, you know, that is Grant's Mozo, and this is the hint, this is yes, the hinterland between worlds in which the characters, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, go go within in, in, in the Twin Peaks series. So, so yes, but just, just returning to the, the, the final trilogy, um, as I say, out, Outer Gateways kind of, you know, sort of sets things up and and uh, you've got various books talked about. One is called The Wisdom of Silver, which I think is spelled S-L apostrophe B-A or something like that, I think it is. I have to check the spelling of this. Um, and another one called uh, Ockbish, uh, The Book of the Spider, which is uh, detailed in... Um, uh, the final uh, book uh, that Grant produced in the trilogy is The Ninth Arch, uh, preceded um, by Beyond the Mozart, which again, you know, kind of, kind of sets things up. And um, it's almost like if you want to see the three trilogies, it's like the first trilogy sets out the background and the occult tradition and the personalities that have, you know, sort of formulated, you know, or, or gone into formulating the Typhonian tradition. And then the second one uh, starts off with this, you know, sort of, 
Kabbalistic, Klipothic, you know, sort of exploration and looking at that and looking at these, you know, sort of extraterrestrial, for want of a better word, forces that have come into play, you know, sort of uh, uh, in the Typhonian tradition. And the final uh, trilogy is kind of devoted to what these entities have actually told mm -hmm. Grant and his circle. You know, it's like the sort of the, you know, sort of the, the various channeled books that have been given, you know, sort of which can, of course, be compared with certain things that Lovecraft had. It must also be remembered that although Lovecraft didn't see himself as a prophet in any way, most of his uh, fictional plots were received through strange dreams. Yes, so, absolutely. you know, there, there, there is, you know, sort of some kind of, uh, you know, um, continuity there, shall we say, Absolutely. and uh, certainly divine dreaming was uh, something which Grant, you know, looked heavily into and saw dreams as very much, you know, a, a, a way of, you know, receiving information from these other worlds. And uh, in within, you know, the trilogies and elsewhere, you know, he talks about various, you know, sort of uh, methods of uh, disassociating yourself with, you know, your current, you know, sort of everyday surroundings and using these dream states to actually access other dimensions and receive uh, the information from them and the Absolutely. entities that dwell there. One of the things that's often talked about at the moment, particularly in the really occult world, which I think all you know, your answer to this question, but the, the, the versus, the psychological model versus the spiritual model, which the, it seems to be dividing a lot of people at the moment, you know, it isn't just brief explain, of course, psychological, it's all in your head and it's all deeply within your psyche, but nothing beyond that, or it is spiritual entities from heaven, hell, whatever that you're dealing with. Um, where do you think Grant would have put himself on that um, which side of that discussion? I think certainly he, he believed that these entities had uh, an external reality to you know his own mindset but I think he also understood um, the connections between your own mindset and how that can actually influence these other dimensions and entities and to, to me I don't think you can if you're a practical occultist I don't think you can really see it from one mindset or the other mm. I think really you have to almost sit between oh, those absolutely. two those two <laughs> mindsets and to me that was that was what Grant did you know there, there was no doubt that first and foremost he was a practical occultist yes. um, and you know certainly obviously having read you know the books uh, there's a lot of weirdness you know and, and certainly having visited some of the sites that Grant talks about as well I mean there's uh, a place called Candleston which is uh, on the borders um, of uh, Wales which is uh, a ruined manor house where Grant actually went out and did ritual and uh, according to the, uh, the story in um, Against the Light actually had revealed to him a grimoire and uh, some candlesticks that he found in a manner which you know is very much uh, akin to the psychic questing of uh, people like Andrew Collins and uh, have written books like The Black Alchemist and things like Finally, this. Enough, I was come to Andy, it doesn't make an appearance in one of um, Grant's books. He does, yes. Um, Grant was actually quite fascinated and uh, did correspond with Andrew for a while. Um, particularly about the uh, the Myanmar saga and the, the Seventh Sword in the fact that, um, uh, and I can't remember the exact details of it, but certainly it was uh, the word Myanmar and its close resemblance to words like Mion, which mm -hmm. was the, uh, the term that I think it was um, Michael Bertio gave to, uh, you know, the Mauve Zone, this kind of, you know, hinterland between worlds. Um, and... Uh, and the, the whole Seventh Sword saga that uh, Andrew wrote about in the, the Seventh Sword book, which um, uh, Kenneth Grant certainly, uh, you know, read. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know certainly Grant was one of the few occultists, probably because of his own experience, that he realised that, you know, this psychic questing stuff, you know, it does work, it can happen. You know, Grant went out and found artefacts like this. And, and uh, you know, this is not, you know, something uh, confined to Grant as an occultist or, or Andrew Collins. I mean, people like the Tibetan monks who follow the Terma tradition, yes, for example, absolutely. have been, you know, doing this sort of thing for years and, and so have others. But it is something which a lot of, you know, practical occultists cannot accept. And I know that Andrew has, you know, had some kind of, you know, backlash yeah. against his work because a lot of practical occultists cannot, you know, accept the reality of going out there following ritual and actually finding something physical. But this was something that, you know, Grant had no problem with and obviously experienced it, you know, himself. So. What clear of that grimoire that you found, do you think? Nobody really knows. I mean, it, it's it's it, oh, and, and what exactly was found is 
is kind of tricky to really pin down because it's not really talked about and although there is a photograph of the candlesticks that were supposedly found with the grimoire within I think it's outer gateways um, there has never been any picture of the grimoire of Clan Grant as it's referred to mm -hmm. uh, or anything told about its actual contents and my own feeling is that the actual grimoire may well be if, uh, although I accept that the the candlesticks, you know, are a physical object. To me, I think the grimoire was probably something that was received astrally rather than physically. Yes, yeah, um, I mean, Grant talks a lot about astral grimoires, and that's obviously what he uh, is of the opinion that Lovecraft's Necronomicon is, that it is an astral grimoire which is actually still accessible by people, yeah. you know, that, that, that it can be read on the astral plane. I suppose the other side of that, of course, is that detractors might say, well, doesn't that just mean he's just made it up? There is always people that are going to say that. Yeah. And uh, the, the only thing I can say to them is obviously they're entitled to their own opinion, but I think that anybody, if they are going to say that, should read Grant's work first and yes. then make up their own you know, sort of mind from that. But all I can say is that certainly... Astral grimoires clearly exist. You know, I mean, this is obviously what the Book of the Law was that, yes. uh, you know, was channeled down, you know, to Crowley. And uh, obviously I've mentioned, you know, the Book of the Spider Rockfish and obviously mm -hmm. the Wisdom of Silver, which is, you know, two channel books that, uh, that came down to Grant. And I think really the only thing you can say as far as, you know, so, well, did they make it all up? Well, there's quite possibly a part of these things which are influenced by the seer or the surroundings or whatever, but... It's the wisdom that these things contain. It's like the proof of the pudding is always in the eating, so Absolutely, to speak. Yeah. It's, you know, and that's what it should be judged on, not not upon, you know, whatever criticism you've got of Grant's methods, if any. Yes, absolutely. No, you know, we have to necessarily question the method for the mature that will arise based on the mature itself and see what that, how that stacks up. And absolutely. Um, of course... Interestingly, you have yourself written a book that d deals with this sort of area. Yes, I have. So perhaps you'd like to just tell us more about it. Yes, no, I mean, I, I was uh, approached after writing um, uh, an essay um, for Sounds Beyond Meaning, a book which is published by American publisher Von Zoz uh, in America, which was um, a series of essays, uh, sort of almost in memoriam of Kenneth Grant in some ways, uh, you know, sort of. Uh, talking about you know sort of various aspects of his work, and off the back of that, I was asked to write a you know a full book or monograph rather um, on some aspects of Kenneth Grant of his work, and uh, I decided therefore to concentrate on uh, how Grant's work um, relates not just to the fictional traditions and the occult traditions that I've spoken about, but also relates to a lot of scientific theory and how that uh, much of what Grant uh, wrote about can now actually be certainly verified in terms of its theory through uh, breakthroughs in quantum science and quantum physics. And there have been a lot of scientists that have come along since, you know, even Grant's time. You know, I mean, obviously the foundations of quantum physics were laid, you know, sort of back with, you know, sort of Einstein and Niels Bohr and other scientists like this, you know, sort of back in the early part of this century. But then you've got sort of uh, modern, uh, you know, sort of um, scientists like David Bohm, for example, who have come along and uh, talked about how these sort of, you know, energies, you know, are things that are, you know, sort of... Um, uh, extraterrestrial and they are actually entities in their own right which you know sort of are probably powered by you know certain certain extraterrestrial energies yeah, um, um, what was your original article about for the uh, my original article actually I, I decided to write um, on um, uh, Kenneth Grant and Gerald Massey it was a you know a, a study showing you know how um, Grant had you know sort of re kind of taken this idea of you know sort of comparative mythology which was something that almost died out in the 19th century you know sort of unfortunately you know sort of advances in sort of archaeology and you know sort of research have shown that you know perhaps the the most famous of all uh, you know jg fraser's golden bow mm. now you know sort of in a lot of ways doesn't hold water because you know sort of there have been you know advances since which have disproved some of these things but Grant saw the value in comparative mythology and as I say looked to people like you know sort of Gerald Massey and various other people and uh, it was Massey that I you know and Grant that I wrote uh, the piece on showing you know how that uh, a lot of what Massey had actually written about you know was probably far ahead of its time and it took Grant really to you know sort of 
put these things back in the public consciousness and, and show their importance. Because as a Jungian psychotherapist, that fascinates me as well. The mythology. Yes, of course. Based on Carl Jung's work, obviously, with the get to unconscious and archetypal connections, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things you're talking about here. There is that level of collectivity that is beneath the purely psychological, which is where you start to find these ideas of these entities. Now, you can say whether they're just purely within the collective unconscious and that they're archetypes. The two aren't dependent upon each other ideas, but they are interconnected, or that they are entities of themselves beyond even that. It's almost a moot point to debate whether that's the case or not, because it's, it's the, again, it's the effect they have in the fact there are transpersonal identities that we can connect with. Yes, yeah, and I mean, I, I think, you know, quantum science is providing a few of the answers in here, which yeah. I have put in, you know, Echoes from the Primal Grimoire, which is the book uh, we've been talking about that I eventually uh, wrote. Uh, that uh, and I think probably um, a scientific study of, plas of plasma is actually yes. providing the yes. answer. That, uh, as I say, I, I quoted you know sort of the work of David Bohm, who has uh, shown that you know sort of plasma is some kind of animating force which actually allows these you know sort of energies or entities for want of you know I think the two you know mm. states are probably interchangeable yeah, here yeah, yeah. Um, uh, to, to actually manifest themselves yeah, yeah, um, you know uh, in, in some kind of way that we can actually perceive in our you know in our world well, that's a fit and of course it grants interest in the advice of the data, that idea of universal oneness it is actually energy we're talking about exactly you know, exactly how is that science of course matter is yes just yes do. yes because yeah. cer certainly you know uh, advice was a very very big you know influence mm. of you know on, on grant i mean out of all of the you know sort of core tenets to his you know sort of uh, way of explaining the typhonian tradition i think really that uh, advice is yeah is, is, is the key of it and this this is why that uh, Grant, you know, looked to comparative mythology because obviously Advaita states that, you know, everything is, you know, part of uh, one great whole. It's all manifestations of the same, you know, yeah, current so, or Brahma, obviously, yeah. in, uh, in, in Hinduism. Yeah, Brahma or a few words, the, the Shiva stuff, of course, again, that's an like active consciousness that's, that's, that's universal as well. Yes. So some of, one of these books does talk about Tantra, has it? there's a fairly large section in which I must have forgotten the title of. Um, I mean, Tantra is mentioned, you know, kind of throughout the trilogies, but I'm trying to think which one of the two. Which I've got because you recommended it. <laughs> I never remember the title. Um, and this is a grant book? Yeah, it's one of those. Oh, you're stories. talking about At the Feet of the Guru? No, no, no. The one that the side was in my bookcase. Oh. You said, oh, that's the one. It's not out of the feet of the guru. No, because it's a collection of essays. If you the guru, yeah. it's a collection of essays, yeah. isn't it? They've been published elsewhere. Um, I mean, it's up to us and sound quite semantic, but what is the one? I can't think of one because it's only a gap. Well, it's yeah, it should, it, should, it should be on the shelf. Three of the nine, so I'll yeah. these ones. Yeah, to pull things forward and yeah. get behind, but. Um, <clears throat> uh, what the hell are we talking about? All track of reality. Yeah. <laughs> What's the one of my shelf that does talk a bit about? Which one talks more about sort of tantric stuff than anything else? I'll cut it all out. <laughs> I'll take that out. Because it's not been doing pretty well for time. So. Mm. There's one of them in particular talks more about it than the others. Mm. It's one that's on my shelf that's sitting there sideways. Mm. <sighs> Don't worry, I can't remember. <laughs> Neither of remember. I'd cut that back. Mm. Yes, I mean, it's, again, you talk about Brahman, or you can talk about the Shaver idea, the one consciousness is active, and it's the entire universe is a reflection of that active consciousness. Um, so tell us a bit more about how you got around to writing the book. What was your kind of influences, as well as obviously from Grant? So was there anything particular that you brought pulled into it? Not really. I mean, I say the, the, the reason I wrote it is because the publisher asked me, yes. you know, to, to, to write something. Um, but I'd already half written a piece which was going to be intended to uh, be published in Starfire Journal, which was on um, Grant's use of magical fiction. Mm. And it had already grown to a length where I thought this is going beyond the length of an article which could, you know, go into a journal. So I spoke to, you know, uh, my good friend Michael Staley, who is, uh, runs Starfire, um, and said, you know, would he mind if I actually, you know, sort of put it into this book instead of an article? And I then gave him another article, which hopefully will come out in the uh, Starfire when it eventually uh, yeah. appears. Um, and uh, then I realised that beyond that, I could actually pull in a lot of elements which 
I've looked into, particularly within my, you know, work with, you know, sort of Andrew Collins, um, uh, which would cover the whole sort of scientific side of things and how I was becoming increasingly fascinated on how grants work when you looked at it in terms of quantum physics and quantum mechanics could actually be verified and this is say was something that grant you know was aware of i mean he made particular reference of a book um called black holes by john griffin griffin Mm -hmm. um which uh you know sort of talks about you know sort of various other dimensions and the way they work in relation to ours and certainly at the time that book came out it was a groundbreaking book and grant saw the importance in that but as i say you know nowadays sadly he's not around on this uh, corporeal plane to see a lot of the recent work of people like david bowen that have you know sort of further you know validated a lot of what grant wrote in magical terms in scientific terms but it was fascinating to also put that you know into this book because for me it was just another dimension in the fact that grant was probably at the forefront of uh, the occult sort of uh, community for for one of a better word in seeing that science and magic are not two opposites they are actually if you look at them they you know there is a lot of mutual compatibility there and there are a number of books that started to come out in the 1970s which started to talk about you know sort of eastern mysticism particularly um and its relation to sort of western science and in particular you know sort of quantum mechanics and quantum physics and grant to me you know sort of laid the foundations of that in terms of a western occult tradition instead of comparing it with eastern stuff in a way which nobody else you know uh, has done before or yeah. since and i'm so. sure that other books will now come out that that will further you know sort of delve into this sort of thing uh, but grant really was at the forefront of this and as i say that's why i really wanted to put that side of it as well into you know to to my book to show that look you know these are the three strands here that we've got that we've got occult fiction we've got the actual you know practical occult tradition and then we have got quantum science which actually all tie together and as far as grant is concerned actually all work together very very well and support each other so beyond obviously the, your book and the three trilogies we've talked about, you, you've mentioned a few times the Starfire magazine. That's um, well, journal a, rather, yeah. Ma- 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 it started as something which might be two times a magazine, yeah. but I think you know the, the the last ones have been published in a nice hardback book format yes. and have been about sort of two or three hundred pages. Yes, quite um, <laughs> but uh, it's it's something which has been going since the nineteen you know sort of eighties, I think mm. it is, when the first one. It might, I think it was about mid 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 nineteen eighties that the first Starfire actually came out, and I think that was under. The the, the title of the, the journal of the uh, of the uh, the to- of the um, uh, Typhoni Notio, I think, yes. <laughs> um, which, as, as we've already said, later had to be uh, changed. But I mean, those are obviously pieces written by um, you know sort of various interested parties, whether they were you know sort of members of the uh, of the Typhoni Notio stroke, you know, order as it now is, or, or not. But uh, but Grant, of course, you know, wasn't just confined to the trilogies. I mean, he wrote another of you know number of other books i mean he wrote images and oracles of austin osmond spare which came out in 1975 originally which was a study of you know uh, spare's work uh, you know sort of uh, and how that kind of uh, related to the typhonian tradition and uh, parts of uh, lovecraft's fiction as well um and uh, he wrote a series he's uh, of things called the Carfax monographs, which uh, originally came out, I think it was in the 60s, and then were reprinted by Scoob um, in one volume, and more recently by Fulger uh, in an updated version as well. And he also wrote uh, Remembering Aster Crowley, which is uh, um, his reminiscences of uh, Crowley's last years when he was down at Netherwood and uh, Grant was in regular communication with him. Uh, so, as I say, there, there, there are several other, you know, sort of books that he's, you know, sort of written. Um, and another one on uh, Grant is Zos, Zos Speak. Uh, sorry, on on Spare is Zos Speaks, which uh, actually gives the full text of Grant's Grimoire of Zos, which is Grant's own magical book. Which again, you know, is uh, a fascinating read and was published together with uh, the Grant um, uh, Spare correspondence uh, by Fulger um, a few years ago now. Yeah, and just briefly mentioned before that the main. Uh, publishing now of Grant's books uh, is Starfire. Yes. We acquired the copyrights on this from people like Muller who published them previously. And they've had a bit of a disaster, we were saying earlier on. Yes, unfortunately, they had a, a warehouse uh, fire um, which destroyed most of the stock because. Uh, uh, Mick Staley's uh, original, you know, idea was to get all of the 
Typhonian trilogies first and foremost um, back into print as uh, certainly you know when they're out of print from the Muller editions there are a few republished by SKU but not all of them and some published the first time by SKU but when they've gone out of print unfortunately it's not quite in the same ballpark as Andrew Chumley books when they go out of print but they've become extremely expensive on the second hand market and obviously the, what uh, Michael wanted to do was uh, get you know disseminate the material out there so people could actually read it at a sensible price and you know sort of republishing you know the books you know around about sort of 30 30 pounds a time, you know, has uh, brought it at least within, you know, the uh, the financial capabilities of most people who do a do actually want to get access to Grant's work. But uh, sadly, now that's all been put back rather because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stock has been, you know, just just as he was coming up to complete in the the, the final one of the final trilogy, mm -hmm. uh, the, this this happens. But then, you know, that's just just unfortunate. Well, the gods, perhaps, but hopefully. Well. The insurance will pay and they'll be covered. And yes, I mean, you know, I, I hope that is the case. You know, I don't know the ins and outs, but uh, yeah, I know when I spoke to Michael in London recently, you know, it's a, a very sad time. Indeed. Well, yeah. we're coming to the end of our interview. Thank you very much for this. Um, what we're going to do is finish in a moment with me, do my narrator's voice again, a little bit of a reading from Richard's, books, um, Richard's book, um, Echoes from a Primal Grimoire. And um, we'll finish it there. So I uh, thank you very much, Richard, for your little. Um, Discussion about Kenneth Grant and his You're books. You're welcome. Absolutely enjoy that. So there you go. I shall now give you my little narrator's voice. So I hope you enjoy it. Although seemingly diverse, the individuals that Grant looked to were all connected by being members of what he termed the true occult order. And although Grant referred to the Great White Brotherhood or AA in this regard, it could be argued that the order simply does not apply in this sense to any particular single body but instead indicates that these bodies are linked in an ever-present chain of continuity that regardless of their own personal religious or magical leanings highlight important facets of the whole this is revealed through the inclusion of many core members of the 19th century occult revival leading up to the formation of the golden dawn their respective traditions forming part of that chain an unbroken stream of consciousness that Grant saw spanning from the OTO, Ordo Templi Orientis, back to the Knights Templar, and therefore to Grant via Crowley. As well as practical occultists, the list includes radical thinker Gerald Massey, whose key works reveal the important information on the stellar mythology of the Typhonian current through its early development in ancient Egypt. Like Grant, Massey was also a published poet, and most of the true occult order wrote fiction of some kind. The Typhonian trilogies document in some detail Grant's fascination with the occult fiction, particularly authors who characterise by otherworldly intrusions those mysterious forms that dwell beyond the frame of our normal perception. Some of those writers to whom Grant looked also wrote from the standpoint of personal magical experience, such as Crowley himself. Charles Williams and Dion Fortune. Those novels reflect in part respective experiences within the Hermetic Order of Golden Dawn. Grant had first relayed his fondness for such works in the 1962 Carfax monograph of Hidden Law. Thus, it is well known that the facts of magic and mysticism have often been preserved in fictional guise, although it is rarely revealed that a definite body of occult doctrine lies in the heart of such literature. With reference to these hidden truths within fiction, Grant cites the work of several other well-known literary figures, including Saxe Roma and George MacDonald. He particularly noted the fiction of Algernon Blackwood and Arthur Macken and J. Brodie Innes, as exemplifying these underlying currents in the work in question. He summed up Blackwood's stories as concerned with elementary powers too immense to be confined by any anthropomorphic or even zoomorphic vehicle. Mackin's central theme, Grant explained, was the alchemical secret of transmuting solid-seeming objects into fluid fantasy of the void. He not only describes the reversion of matter into its primal state of liquescence, but also into the process of avativism, breaking through into normal channels of evolution and causing the ingress of forces fatal to mortals with whom they come into contact. That's taken from Echoes from the Primal Grimoire, 
Kenneth Grant, H. P. Lovecraft and the Magical Reality in the Quantum Universe by Richard Ward. Available from Von Zoss Books. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show this evening and our discussion of Kenneth Grant. I'll be back next month with a new topic and a new guest. And hopefully you'll be tuning in. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>